Well, this show is going to be about all of our, one of our most favourite fish, the rainbow trout. And uh, I'm going to show you pictures from all around the country, some around the rest of the world. And I want you to just appreciate what this gorgeous fish does for us. But the interesting thing about the rainbow trout is that we're here talking in early December. And in the last few weeks, this was going on on all the fish farms throughout the country where people are netting up the fish, getting them ready for stripping and then doing this of squirting the eggs into a bowl and this is how it all starts for us. And you, this work you don't see that goes on. This fish are then, the eggs are then, sorry, put into this bowl, the milt is squirted into them and then the fertilised eggs are immediately put into a pressure container and brought up to 9,000 psi and that creates the triploid fish which we see as the most common thing we catch nowadays. And times really have changed in this fishing world. And we need to really appreciate some of the things that go along to give us these fun events to be able to go and enjoy fishing. And uh, this is a pal of mine from Cornwall, fishing uh, down on a lake down there, having fun. This is what it should all be about, is having fun. One of my jobs is I see many, many different fisheries throughout the country. And I do this stuff for Trout and Salmon and formerly for Trout Fisherman magazine. And I work a lot with this gentleman, this is Peter Gathercole. So most of what I see of him is holding a camera like this, trying to get action shots of me doing the right thing. Um, not quite as easy as you might think, but we do have a lot of fun on our different days out. And uh, there he is, I've just managed to catch something and he's working. And you think it would be dead easy, but he will probably take 30 odd shots of that one sequence of a fish to get the right one that he wants before it's all ready for the magazine. It's not just snap happy like my taking pictures. He's the ace. This was um, Raven's Nest in South Wales. We did that feature a couple of years ago. Lovely little fishery. Back when I was young and handsome, when the hair was a little darker than it is now, this is around about 85, 86, and way, way before triploid rainbow trout. But they were still available in this sort of quality. This was an Avington fish of 1814, I think, and that tail span is 10 inches. A reared fish, but they were available like that sort of quality then. And things have got better and better over the years. The days of this sort of thing are long gone. I bet most of you have never seen this. This is a male rainbow in appalling condition in its winter colouring. And they were quite common at this time of year because that was all that was available for stocking. So you would see these things and you'd catch it and it would spurt milt all over you and then the flesh would go really flaccid and horrible and they weren't worth catching. But that's what it was. It was male and female fish back then and gradually the triploiding thing came along to give us better quality. This would have been pretty much a normal stock fish probably, what's this, 30, 35 odd years ago, grown a bit too fast, it's a bit puffy in the body, too much fat in the belly region, you can see in the belly there, and um, fins aren't so great, but it's what it was, and, but things really have improved, and it's not at all uncommon now to find stockfish of this quality, um, where they've been reared on the farm for a couple of years, to these fabulous looking things. Um, we tend to take them for granted, that they're just another stocky. It isn't. It's a culmination of a lot of hard work to get it that way. And then as they grow and they're constantly graded to get bigger and better fish, you can often end up on a fishery with a tro absolute trophy fish like this. This was, um, I think, 19 odd from Deaver Springs where I work now. This is a fish coming into its fourth year or to the end of its fourth year. They don't go much beyond that. The odd one, you can push them to five, maybe six I've heard of occasionally. Most times it's coming up to four years. And at that stage, it's quite likely it'll just simply die on you after having spent four years growing it to this. Tricky old things, these big rainbows, but beautiful fish nevertheless. And uh, if you're interested in a bit of history, this was Muggins with the first ever UK 20 pounder. This was a 20 pound seven ouncer, and that held the British record for a while. And again, look at the quality of it, fantastic thing. Now, uh, what it might, you might be puzzled by, here's a little tip. If you get a really trophy fish and you can't get a great shot at the time, th this fish was photographed about 
50 miles away from where I caught it uh, because I had to get a photographer come down from London because this was a record fish and it had to be done properly. So what I did with it was put, wrap the fish in cling film to smooth over every part of its body surface, popped it in a freezer for an hour and then took it out and all the colour comes back up when you do that. So we got the fish looking at its absolute best. Clever one. <laughs> so next one. This is a winter shot. This is how we're going to be the next few days over here in the UK, I reckon. Uh, frost on the ground and you can just make pretty pictures using different light angles. It's a matter of getting your fish to look good. Um, and I'm going to say something in a while, which I know a lot of people aren't going to like, but uh, I'll come to that in a minute. There's a reservoir fish. This was um, Arlington Reservoir down in Sussex. Sadly, no more. It's being closed. It's not going to be a trout fishery any longer. Great shame. But uh, reservoir fish can be very special with great big tails if they're able to grow on in the water. Doesn't happen everywhere, but some reservoirs can grow fish. And this one here came from Hanningfield in Essex in the days when Hanningfield had fish cages and reared enormous quantities of rainbows in the cages. And underneath those cages, you get huge bloodworm beds and the rainbows were feeding on the bloodworm and growing enormously. I think uh, Hanningfield produced rainbows over 20 pounds at one time. Took the cages away, the bloodworm beds disappeared and the growth rate isn't there anymore. It was all down to bloods. And if you caught fish of this quality there, this is my friend Phil Barker with one, and tried to spoon them, you couldn't get the marrow spoon down the throat because it was jammed with bloodworms. Amazing what they can do on these tiny items of food. Another contrast to where you can see rainbows, this is a, is a part of the River Test in Hampshire, stocked with rainbow trout to a great degree. Um, gradually going more over towards brown trout stocking only, which is good to see but people still want to catch a trophy fish and that was a double off the river test. That was a bit of fun. <laughs> um, I, have, I don't chase big fish much anymore, but I did do in my days and this was a, a pretty fish here. Did I catch that? That was a Deaver fish, I think. Yeah, Deaver Springs. And um, here's a tip to make your pictures look good. If you can see from that one, my right hand is behind the fish's gill plate my left hand, the index finger is tucked into the fish's vent, so I'm holding the fish. So all you can really see is the fish. And then it looks great instead of a great big grubby pair of hands all around it. And uh, the other thing I said I was going to mention in a lot of these shots is no hat, no glasses. Almost all the fishing pics I'm seeing now on Facebook are sunglasses, hat. Could be anybody. Wonderful fish, could be anybody. If you're afraid of seeing it showing your face, fine. But take your glasses off. Make a great picture. Um, here's a fun one. This was uh, netting a pretty big fish back in the days when I used to wear a silly cowboy hat. <laughs> My son's filming all this and I can see him laughing at me now. I don't wear it anymore, Jeff. It's all right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that's a big old fish to lift out in a landing net. And I really, really enjoyed those days of, of catching big fish. Um, I still do it to a degree of course but sometimes on fisheries now you're able to release large reared fish. Tricky subject, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't and you have to respect the fishery manager's decision. If they say you can release big trophy fish, fine. If they say it's catch and kill, that's what it is. If you're smarter, you run a fishery. So d interesting times. Now I know if you fish in the UK a lot, you will have seen some other types of fish around and these are beginning to get more and more common. This is the gold and the blue rainbow. These are just colour sports of the ordinary rainbow trout, which the fish farmers selected out the little baby fry when they saw these funny coloured ones, mixed two blues together, mixed two golds together and fixed the colour strain so they can now breed blues or golds. They aren't a separate species, they are just a colour sport of the ordinary rainbow. But interestingly, when you catch one next, say for example, look at your blue, and you'll see that the eye is blue. And then if you look at your gold, the eye of the goldie is gold coloured. It's not just the body, the eye colours up as well. And um, they come in all sorts of colour phases. This is a rearing pond at Damerham in Hampshire with all different colours of blues in it. 
and they're fun. They tend to be a bit higher in the water, I don't quite know why, but a fascinating fish nevertheless. So it's not just blues and golds, sometimes you might just come across one of these. This is a pink rainbow. I've only seen them these last two or three years and they are decidedly pink. So yet another one that we may start to see around. And uh, there is also an albino rainbow. I don't have a picture of that and I've personally never seen one. So you never know what's coming along. Now, little question for you. Who are these two gentlemen? If you've been fishing for a while, you ought to know. One on the left is Bill Sibbons, one of the most famous stalkers of his day, sadly left us now. And standing beside him is our own Charlie Jardine, who is undoubtedly Britain's number one angler. He is the man and a wonderful friend and a fantastic angler. And he'll catch fish to order. He runs the Fishing for Schools charity and does a wonderful job on that. So who are these two? Testing one. If you're a course fisherman, you ought to know the one on the right. That's Peter Stone. Um, and the one on the left is Bernard Cribbins. And Bernard with a pretty big rainbow. A few years ago now, because Peter's been dead for almost quite some time. But uh, a great guy nevertheless. So lots of fun things you can do in fishing in the UK. One of which is this. Float tubing. That's with Keith Arthur in the boat there and we're shaking hands prior to setting off fishing at Bushy Lees in um, Gloucestershire when we did a, a sequence there for Sky Sports when the water was so cold when we finally got out of the lake neither of us could stand because our legs weren't working anymore but we did have a lot of fun although I've always enjoyed this shot of Keith uh, because it looks like he's got a little bit of a, an abdominal problem <laughs> sorry Keith so I'm going to show you some more rainbows now from different places and yet these might tempt you to want to try something else. We do have fantastic fishing in the UK but there's also rainbows all around the world and some as you know they originate in the Pacific Northwest and these are rainbows you find in Alaska and they tend to be called leopard rainbows because they're covered in spots and they're an extremely pretty fish. They live a lot longer than our UK fish and they're very, very special things. And people who come on trips to Alaska with me every summer, that's what they want to catch, is one of these wonderful leopard rainbows. And uh, you can see the immense amount of spots on them and that magenta striped in the side. They are very heavily coloured, mostly. And I remember seeing this one. I could see the red stripe working up the gravel bar towards me until I eventually I could see the fish itself. I mean, it was so heavily coloured. They even get spots on their eyes. They are a really lovely fish. But you also get the silver form of the rainbow up there. And um, this is one of the better ones I caught one year. Got that on a hare's ear nymph. But we also catch them on mice, on scoping imitations, on huge flesh flies. There's many, many ways you can catch Alaskan rainbows. I've caught them on dries, all sorts of stuff. Catching them on mice is probably the best fun. Uh, that's one of the biggest I ever caught in Alaska. That was just short of 10 pounds. And that one I caught on a sculpin one morning. Sculpin is a little bait fish, and they really like to eat them. So Alaska is a wonderful place to go. And these are the native rainbows that live in the rivers. There is another rainbow in Alaska, which is the migratory one. This is the one we call steelhead. And uh, this gentleman here on my left, tapping me on the shoulder, is Jim Teeny from Oregon. And it's his fault entirely that I spent probably well, 30 years in Alaska and about 20 going to Kodiak as well to fish for steelhead. Um, so I blame it all on Jim. But steelhead is the migratory form of the rainbow trout. And when they're fresh in from the ocean, they have this fantastic silver colour with that steely colour on the head. Possibly that's why they get that name. But they really are the most wonderful looking fish. When they've been in the river a little while, and they want to do their thing and start to spawn, they change colour. So steelhead, which looked like this, when they come into the river, about a month later, they've coloured up and they look like a rainbow because that's what they are. Um, Kodiak is one of those places which is remote. It's a huge island off Alaska and 
it's an adventure trip more than any others of the ones I do. And the landscape is gorgeous in late fall. We're usually there late September, October. The colours on the bushes and everything, it's, it's really, really pretty. But there's an awful lot of walking involved and it is really remote. The sun sets really quick there as a guide with them um, holding up a steely. And you might notice that lump sticking out behind his head. That's a shotgun. And it's one of the few places I fish where they carry a shotgun. And um, you'll see why in a few minutes. But Kodiak, that time of year, it's coming, winter's coming, and it comes really quick. And we've had some interesting trips there when winter has come a little earlier than we anticipated. So I've ended up fishing like this <laughs> in the snow. And you have to wonder why you're doing it sometimes. Um, but that thing on my head is a, a native fur hat. And that's the best thing you can ever put on your head in cold weather. It really keeps you warm. Um, but some of those days fishing in the snow and the ice, catching steelies, it's interesting. <laughs> and they, they love it. They fight really, really well. They're beautiful, beautiful fish. And uh, you have to wonder at my mentality to be able to lie in the snow and try and take a picture of a fish. But that's what you do. It's an adventure. And I reckon, I reckon I've got one more Kodiak trip left in me. So we'll see. That's probably the biggest one I ever caught there. That was um, 35 inches long and about 17 and a half around, which is a, a pretty big steelhead for Kodiak. I was really, really happy with that one. It was an epic battle and I, I looked wrecked and I was. Um, they're a bit of a handful, but they are also extremely pretty. And I tried to take the odd close-up shot of heads and stuff to make, just show the fish off in its, in its beauty. They are lovely things. Um, yeah, there's one just lying in the green grass on Kodiak and just a classic steelhead shape, long and slim, beautiful condition. We do see on the island quite a lot of foxes um, and they will come along the river and they'll try to get a char. If you're playing a char, they'll try to grab the char and take it back to eat, to eat it. And we, we see them quite a lot. Sometimes when you're fishing, something like this is watching you. And that's when you've got to think, Okay, let's be careful here. Um, Kodiak grizzlies are the biggest in the world. They're truly not interested in man. They've got so much food, they don't want to eat man. But nevertheless, respect them, keep out of the way, let them know you're human, wave your arms and shout, and they'll normally get out of the way. But that is the one reason why the guides on Kodiak carry a shotgun, just in case. <laughs> I told you it's a bit of an adventure. But uh, they're, they're quite a fish to catch. If you fancy it, go for steelhead once. They'll, they'll test you, but they're beautiful. That's that same head shot. And there, there's one that's colouring up again. Been in the river a little while, beginning to colour up, looking just like a rainbow trout again, which is what I've been talking about, the different forms of the rainbow trout. And uh, it's a wet, cold experience in a very fast, rapid river. Oh, I missed the click. And uh, that was 34 inches. Look at the size of the tail on it. Fish like that, I usually reckon with steelhead, if I, if I land half of the ones I hook, I reckon I'm doing pretty well. They're really acrobatic. They leap, they throw the hook, and they're a bit of a handful. So that's another form of the rainbow trout. I've got another rainbow trout I'm going to show you now. And I caught this one on a trip when I was down in Tierra del Fuego fishing for um, sea run brown trout. And we fished a lake uh, because the river was blown out one day. And I caught this fantastic rainbow trout in a lake on uh, Tierra del Fuego. And they've been planted there and, and they're just gorgeous. So lots of different places you can find rainbows. The last sequence of shots I'm gonna show you are a place I've been going to now for I guess 10 years or so where I'd heard about these majestic rainbows uh, down in southern Argentina, and you've probably heard of it yourself, a place called Jurassic Lake. Its proper name is Lago Strobel, and we always refer to it as Strobel. It's um, where rainbows were introduced not that long ago, but have found it to be a wonderful place for them, and they can grow to this quality. They don't come much lovelier than that for a wild rainbow. 
And Strobel is uh, a pretty remote place. It's the place we stay is Estancia Laguna Verde, and it's an epic drive to simply get there. And a lot of the trip is um, <laughs> over pretty remote, dusty countryside. There isn't a lot here. It's an awful lot of rock um, and dirt and road and stuff, but the lake is about eight miles by 10 miles. It's only got shrimps, daphnia, and some small snails in it. A few other insects, but not much. And the fish feed enormously on these things and grow incredibly well, which is why it's become like a mecca for people wanting to catch truly impressive rainbows. And um, I've been lucky a few over the years, and they are exceptional quality. Strobel is a place that will test you. It's not the easiest place in the world to fish. It can be quite challenging on its day. It's big, it's remote, the terrain is a bit rough, um, but the fish are there. This is my friend uh, Kevin with one of the fish we caught the first year we went there. Look at the silvering right down into the fish's tail. These are really high quality rainbows. And um, I've had a good many of this size in the mid to upper doubles. And they will test you. You, you. We fish 15 pound tippet or you will be broken. And we fish usually with the flies made on carp hooks or barbel hooks. If you fish like a conventional um, trout hook on a buzzery type, it will be straightened. So you've got to use the gear for the job, mostly eight and nine weight rods. It's nice when you get a calm day and you can fish lighter, but that doesn't often happen. See all sorts of things down here. These are Wanako. Um, lots of them in the area. How, do, how they find food to exist, I don't know. It doesn't seem to be any grass there, but uh, they do. And they're an interesting animal and they will come quite close to you at times. Strobel, as I say, is exceedingly remote. At some time in the distant past, somebody went over this terrain with a cart, probably an oxen or a couple of horses, and decided to make a home there on the lake right in front of the lodge. There were no trout there then. There are no other fish in this area. All they would have had were the Wanako, the Rhea, which is a little flightless ostrich, and whatever else they'd taken with them. How they even got there, it boggles the mind, but they made a home there and somehow existed. I'd love to know the story, but I don't think anything exists about how, what, who they were or anything. But somebody went there a long, long time ago. We see foxes at uh, Strobel as well. Um, quite small, these, the southern fox, but they're, they're really quite friendly with humans, and um, you can get them to come and take a uh, bit of lunch out of your hand. That's quite fun. But it's the fish we go after. So look at the tail on this, this fish. These are the highest quality rainbows you can find. And uh, yeah, just I love taking pictures of the tails here. They are quite something. The landscape is interesting. Here's two of my friends walking towards us. Um, and it's like calcified rock. It's so, the pH is so high, there's this calcified deposit on every rock and the levels have obviously gone up and down over millennia. So you're walking through like a moonscape of these rocks covered in this white deposit. And in this pic, you can see how the, they've made like a mushroom shape on top of the rocks where the waves break over the rocks and deposit the crystalline stuff there. And you don't want to fall on that. That would, um, you'll get a bit of a cut from that, but incredible place for fish. And uh, this, this weird, weird landscape. And the fish on the calmer days will come right into the shallows in amongst these rocks and hooking one and trying to hold it without losing it and the line getting around those rocks, that's a challenge. <laughs> but um, they jumped fantastically and they really, really are the most wonderful fish. Here's a, I think there's a pick here, yeah. Look at the body on that fish, fantastic things. It's um, somewhere that drags me back year on year on year. And you can see here the incrustation on the rocks, it's about six to nine inches thick. Um, and I guess I, it's why the lake is so rich, it can produce so much food. This fish almost looks like a steelhead, it's so perfect, but it's a rainbow, which is a steelhead. 
and this has strobel itself. Um, but it's, look at the great tail on it, almost as good as the fish these days are coming out of uh, Grafham and Rutland. I tried to take pretty pictures as well. This was a sort of late evening shot and the, the fish come into the net. A sunset shot looking quite pretty. A little bit of wildlife. We see condor down here occasionally. This is the thing with a 10 foot wingspan. Not very often, but we do see them. Uh, we see this chap, which is a black chested buzzard eagle. <laughs> Good old name that is. Another predator. The uh, legs, the smaller legs and lagoons in the area will often have black necked swans in them. And you can tell that this is so rich in food because flamingos are here and they can feed in the shallows and grow very successfully. So there is a lot of food there. It's a place where if you don't necessarily like the wind, you might not enjoy it. <laughs> Strobel is high, 3,000 feet high. There isn't much there. If the wind blows, it's breezy. And, uh, but if you can cope with the wind, the fish are there in those waves. I've had the most fantastic fights from fish in those big waves. And if you fish a sheltered bay, you can see the wind coming around the corner into the bay and uh, it'll induce a current in the bay and the fish are in that current feeding on the shrimps which get dislodged by the water. Um, it can be breezy, just like down off the south coast on a, a, a rough day, but it can also be flat calm. And it's one of those places which uh, makes you want to go back time and time again breezy day or not, whatever the conditions, at midday everybody gathers together in one of the shelters and the guides cook up a hot lunch and everybody tells stories about what they've caught, you know, it's a, it's a good time. And whether they're fish of this size or monster size, it doesn't really matter, they're just incredible things. I would guess, you hear all sorts of stories about fish sizes, the strobel average is probably a true seven pounds. Um, and you've got every chance of getting a fish into the high doubles and maybe more than that. They are there, they're a bit of a handful, but they are there and that's what everybody goes for. Uh, that one was, I don't know what that is, it's, um, it's a mid, mid to high double. They're there, lots of fish. Uh, not a great shot, or they've got the hat and the jacket on, but um, that is a male rainbow, which we don't see much here. But these are naturally occurring fish, so you get males and females. And this shot shows a male rainbow more, be more easily. That elongated jaw and the, the head is on a, a female rainbow. The head and the um, gill plate are egg shaped. On a male, it's a stretched egg. And that's the easy way of telling whether you've got a male or female fish. And popping these beautiful creatures back in. It's all catch and release down there. But look at the depth of this fish's body and it's doing it on Daphnia and little shrimps. They must be eating machines to get to this quality. I like taking other sorts of pictures of fish and um, a head shot is, is always an interesting one. And that's a head of a strobel rainbow in its pure silver phase. And the easy way to know if somebody's taking a, a shot of a fish which is going to be released is to look at the eye. If the eye of the fish is looking down towards the mouth, that fish is alive. If the eye is looking straight out from the body, it's dead. So that's an easy way of sorting that out. So this is a pure silver one, and then here's one that's got all the coloration on his cheeks and stuff. But those headshots do make for good looking fish. We've had a few beauties down there. This was uh, one of the biggest I've caught. This was... Um, Got to remember now, yeah, that was 21 pound, that fish. That's, that's the biggest I've personally managed to land. I've tangled with a few others, but not managed it. Um, but a fish of that size is certainly going to sort you out for quite some time. My pal Kevin that's been with me a few times, he um, had an absolute purple patch one day with a couple of 18s and then a 23. <laughs> I don't know how he did that. <laughs> but it was the, the fish of dreams of a rainbow of that size. Uh, what have we got coming next? This is, oh, the head of a male one. See that long shape again? Interesting, isn't it? They are interesting fish. 
and fishing off the rocks here with my friend's rod one day. That was interesting, trying to fish there. We, we caught some fish, but uh, it can be tough in the wind. But then the calmer days like this, you can get these fantastic fish, and uh, that was 14 or 15 pound. It's not at all uncommon fish of that size. Seriously not. And uh, so a couple more picks of uh, Strobel to show you the breezy days down there in the wind. Um, that's the same one you showed earlier. This was uh, the last year I fished. That was about eighteen pound, and um, just pure bar of silver. Friend who goes with me frequently is Clem Booth, and he is Strobel obsessed. He spends all his time tying flies, ready for the next trip. And the last time we were there, Clem got his dream fish. He got his twenty pounder, and you can see from the smile on that man that he was really, really happy. <laughs> And it was great to be there and to be able to take the picture with him. It's just an, an epic event. So, strobel fish with these fantastic tails, these wonderful bodies, great big, fit, super strong fish. Something different to look at from the fishing we've got here in the UK, which is nevertheless fantastic. But I thought I might stretch your mind a bit. So now if you've got any questions or anything you want to ask me, we will carry on, see what I can do. So, sorting this out. Uh, thanks for joining in, everyone. Uh, hopefully, you can all hear me. Uh, can you hear me, Dad? Yeah, I can hear okay. you. So, um, we asked the question, what's the biggest rainbow you've ever caught, and where was it from? So, Christopher Fuller said uh, a 12-pound at Letchlade. Uh, uh, Sue Cockwell said uh, she doesn't know, but it was Alaska. Yeah, Sue, Sue loves the rainbow trout when she goes to my wife, when she goes to Alaska with me. She doesn't want to catch salmon, she just wants to catch those gorgeous rainbows. Uh, Martin Robino Alvarez says, um, <laughs> of course, on Strobel Lake, uh, Laguna Verde Lodge uh, at Jurassic Lake. Yeah, he's uh, one of the guides we fish with, and Martin had the biggest uh, fish I know of from Strobel at about, I think it was 26 or 27 pounds. He is one mean angler, but uh, he's very kind to me, I'm not quite sure why, but he, he, he is nice to me. Uh, hold on one second, just adjusting the sound. Uh, Tammy Sternoff uh, says 15 pounds in Madras, Oregon. Hey, yeah, Tammy. I fished a lake there with, um, with Jimmy. Uh, what was it called? Pry 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 near Prineville, uh, Pronghorn Lake. And I had a 13 pound rainbow there in the tube, so you've beaten me, a little devil. <laughs> Uh, hold on one second. Yeah, here. Oh. Slight pause here. Okay. Uh, Dave Woods says uh, 15 pound 8 ounces at Avington back in 1990. My goodness, Dave, I didn't know you were that old. Uh, Michael Rescorley, uh, I hope I've pronounced that right. 13 pound 13 ounce uh, Moorhen trout fishery, uh, but also a 13 pound 7 ounce at Rockbourne two weeks ago. Yeah, I saw that picture of Michael catching that fish. Now, Michael's coming to Alaska next summer with me, and uh, we are going. The coronavirus thing I'm hoping is solved. We are going to Alaska, Michael. Everything was cancelled this current year, but we're going. Uh, whether you get a 13-pound rainbow there, I don't know. If you do, boy, oh, boy, it's going to be an event. Um, <clears throat> Stuart Easy says, Hi, Peter. 14-pound, 3-ounce, uh, also from Letchlade as well. Yep, Stuart, he's a dedicated angler. He loves stalking and uh, trying to get a bigger and bigger fish every time. Um, and then we've just had uh, Sam Mathy, 13 pound at Hazel Cops. 13 pounder at Hazel Cops, geez, that's a big boy from there. Yeah. Um, okay, and then um, we've also asked, uh, have you ever faced a wild animal whilst fishing? <laughs> what, you mean like another angler? <laughs> <laughs> so Alex Hill says yes, uh, Arctic terns dive bombing you whilst fishing in Iceland. Yeah, had that one, Alex. Uh, Martin Wormald said uh, the fer most ferocious animal he's ever encountered was a badger. They can be nasty if they're in close quarters. I remember trying to get one out of a fox snare, and uh, boy, oh boy, that thing was not happy. But we 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 got it away. Uh, Don Palmieri says wild deer and birds of prey. Dom, I wonder where that was. I mean, Dom comes from Guernsey, so I don't, don't think you've got any out there, but yeah, deer can be 
when they're in their in the rut, they can be a bit tricky. I wouldn't want to get near um, like a moose or anything like that in the rut period. Uh, Martin uh, Rubino says uh, fox and puma. Yeah, Martin, he saw the the puma at Strobel, and uh, oh, we were all so jealous of that. And then the very next day, I think it was, or within a day or so, he found uh, one of the round stones from the bolus things where they whirled them around their heads to knock animals over. And Martina, in this place of rock, found one of those balls. I mean, first he sees a puma, then he finds one of those balls. So we all said to him, we're in this lodge, you know, which is so remote. We said, get in the truck, drive to the nearest town and do the lottery. You're on a roll. Um. Dom says it was in Italy. Pardon? A, a Dom's uh, deer and birds of prey were in Italy. Okay. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so um, we're getting quite a few things coming in at the moment. So going back to the biggest rainbow you've ever caught, Alex Hill says £21, 9 ounces at Diva. Wow, and Alex. And £20, 10 ounce at Avington. He's a big fish man, he really is. You've got to come on a trip with me, Alex. Come to Strobel, catch a big one there. Um, Stuart Easy says the most ferocious animal he's ever faced have been aggressive swans. <laughs> yeah, ask my wife about swans when you <laughs> see her next, Stuart. Because uh, she actually got kicked on her thigh by a swan. I would never have believed it unless I'd actually seen it. That This swan reared up at her and kicked her on the thigh. Sue does not like swans. Okay, so we've got a few questions here. Um, so Sam Mathy says, uh, do you get the impression that the emphasis on stocking trout has changed since the 90s? And if so, how? Yeah, it's definitely changed in that people want bigger and bigger fish. Um, but it's had to change to a large degree because of cormorant predation, particularly on the bigger waters. Um, I mean, my, my books and stuff, my record books show on the reservoir days that you know, a, a one pound trout was a big fish. And you were have really happy if you got a two pounder. Well now the minimum stock size is two pound, but it had to happen because of cormorant predation. Um, we've had to move with the times and each fishery is different. Some fisheries stock for a more modest size. Uh, some stock the big ones, some stock only a few bigger ones. And it's, it all comes down to whether the fishery can make an operational profit and keep it going. It's not easy. I know because I've run a fishery myself for 34 years and I'm now working at, at Dever as well and I see lots and lots of fisheries around the country. I've talked to fishery managers and fish farmers and the anglers basically have never had it so good in my opinion. Uh, so we've got a question from Christopher Fuller. Do you have any advice on stalking big fish at venues such as Lechlade and Rockbourne? Patience. Patience, eyesight, obviously Polaroids and some eye shade. And keep looking, looking, looking. Don't just keep casting away. Save the cast for that critical right moment when you've spotted one. And you're not going to see that many. You know, realistically, there can't be hordes of doubles everywhere. Um, but they are there, and you, you just got to keep looking for them and then try and get that chance. Alex Hill says, did you ever fish... Nyth Lakes? Yeah, I did, Alex, yeah. Yeah, back then I remember that lake, then uh, just north of Alsford. Uh, hold on. Uh, Rob Kendrew says, Kodiak looks a stunning place to, f place to fish, a true wilderness. It really is, yeah, there's, um, there's no one there. I mean, there's just us six anglers and the four guides. There is no one else there. It, it's really remote. Um, Rez uh, I hope I've pronounced that right. He says, uh, would love to fish there. Uh, what was that one? Uh, f from Rez Kumadine. I'm not sure if I've pronounced that right. Um, I think he's talking about Kodiak. Uh, Stuart Easy says, beautiful wild fish. Uh, Alex Hill says, the strobel fish look incredible. The silver in the tails is stunning. Um, Lindsay Simpson says, stunning looking fish. Uh, so here's a question from Alex Hill. Does anyone fish from a boat on Strobel? No. Because <laughs> when that wind gets up, Alex, bye-bye, you die. It's eight mile by ten mile. And when the wind gets up, it can be ferocious. No. 
I think occasionally when there's been a dead calm day for a couple of days, people have gone out in a boat and fished in, under those calm conditions. I would be very careful checking the forecast if ever I did that. I can't swim, you know, if, if I go over, that's the end of me. And it's cold there. I don't think you'd last long in that water. It's cold. Uh, question from uh, Jamie Griggs. Do the boys at Diva Springs treat you well? <laughs> no, is the answer. They do horrible things to me. Jamie works there. And, uh, I mean, you can't believe that a chap, you know, that you work with would, like, leave a dead moorhen inside your, your Wellington boots. I mean, but I get my own back. Jamie, your days are numbered. I'm going to get you. Um, Alex Hill says, have you ever fished the canals in New Zealand? No, I haven't. I've been to New Zealand, but it was a long time ago when the Commonwealth uh, Championships were on. I got the chance to fish that. But there is um, one or two canals there which are producing enormous trout, browns and rainbows. Um, it's something to do with salmon rearing or fish farming in the canals. I don't know the full story, but their food must be there to produce incredible looking fish. So that's another venue to maybe look at, Alex. Um, so we've got a couple more bits here. If anyone else has got any questions, please feel free to ask, type them in. Um, we've got a comment from Pete Hart here. Uh, he recently watched Ollie kite fishing at, uh, at Alex Barrett's... Be Alex Barrett's lakes. Yeah, so Tri Lakes. Called, they were called Two Lakes. Uh, things sure have come a long way since then. Yeah, haven't they just? Um, so Don Palmieri asks, when stripping eggs, how do they get from the milt? How do they get the milk from the male? <laughs> Interesting one, this Don. They they don't really use male rainbows much nowadays. They have what are called reverse cocks. I know it's a strange terminology, but it's a, a hen rainbow, which is fed with food with hormones in it, which makes the fish produce testes inside the body. So when it's time for fertilization, they strip the eggs out of the female fish and then they kill the male and take the testes out from it, cut them open and mix the sperm in with the eggs because they can't, that fish cannot actually eject the eggs from it or the sperm from its body because it's, although it's got the testes in there, they're not connected to the outside. So that's how it's done. Not much fun for that fish. I don't suppose it is, but hey, that's, that's the way it's done nowadays. Uh, Sam Matthew says, um, dangerous animals in this country have been swans and cows, and he did spot a great horned owl in Colorado. The oh, guide yeah. advised us not to wear any furry hats uh, when they were around because the talons are deadly. Yeah, that's a big bird, that is. Yeah, serious bird. And Pete Hart says the scariest thing from, for him was an Irish bull. <laughs> um Gary Carr says, great talk this evening. I've loved fishing with you. Great memories of Kodiak yeah, and Strobel. Yeah, Gary, come again, my boy. And Stuart Easy says, what flies do you use at Strobel? Are they shrimp imitations? Oddly enough, Stuart, we fish quite large streamer patterns and um, even snakes work really well. Those fish are simply curious. I reckon most of the fish you catch have never seen a fly before. This place is eight miles by 10 miles. There's very, very few people ever fish it. Um, but when it's breezy, the bigger flies work absolutely fine. When it's calm, the big flies don't work. And then we do fish with shrimp imitations and little nymphs and things. Um, and under an indicator is extremely successful there. It, it is interesting how when the wind then gets back up again, the big flies work again. It's a bit of a conundrum, Strobel. Mandy Darlison asks, is there anywhere in the world where you would still like to fish? <laughs> Hi, Mandy. I see Mandy every morning. She works at Diva and uh, she's our voice at the end of the phone and does all the tickets and stuff. Yeah, I guess there's places I want to go still, Mandy, and um, perhaps we'll have to have a working fund and send me away for a few weeks so you all get some peace at Diva. Um, so we've also ran a poll uh, during tonight's talk and we've just published the results. So um, the question was, out of the mentioned places, where would you most like to, to go fishing? Uh, Kodiak in Alaska was the top uh, choice with 11 votes. Uh, Argentina had three and England had two. There you go. Well, thanks everybody for participating tonight and for sending in questions. We've had a lot of fun. We're going to do another talk in about another month's time. 
and this one will be purely on the things you can catch and see in, on an Alaska trip. I've been going there for over 30 years. We're going to talk about the salmon, the char, and I'm going to show you lots of pictures again then. So these are destination trips which are worth considering. So that will be the next talk, which will be early January, I think, Jeffrey. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So thanks very much for watching tonight. And um, we're over and out. And thank you.